right, take your Bibles tonight and turn to Psalms chapter 32. Psalms chapter 32. All right, as you can see, I've chose not to do a PowerPoint tonight. I really feel like we'll just be examining some texts uh, tonight and uh, maybe doing a little more of a Bible study and ending up in a, another chapter in Psalms and making some observations. Uh, and I just hope to uh, challenge us to examine ourselves with the topic that we will be discussing. Uh, as you're turning to Psalms chapter 32, if you're not there yet, a legend says that the devil once came to a sinner uh, during confession, saying that he came to make restitution. On being asked what he would restore, the devil said, I will restore to the sinner shame, for it is shame that I have stolen from the sinner, making him shameless in sinning, and now I have come to restore it to him, to make him ashamed to confess his sin. If there's one thing that the devil wants to do initially is he wants to take shame from us so that when we approach sin in our lives, we have no reservations about committing it. That's what the devil would love to see happen in our lives. And I think that's something we need to be extremely mindful of because I think we lose sight on the magnitude of what sin is. Sin is the transgression of God's law. I think we get a little bit too comfortable in our own skin. Uh, pretty much uh, every day that we live, probably. Uh, so the devil would like to take that shame away from us so that we have no shame in sinning. We just freely do it. We freely commit sin. We freely do those things that we ought not to do. But then once we have committed those sins, it's as though the devil wants to restore that shame to us so that we then don't take the necessary steps to get our sins taken care of. And forgiven, uh, and this is an important, th uh, an important thing. In Psalms chapter 32, our initial text here, I'd like to read verses 1 through 5. So if you'd look with me in verse 1, it says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So we can stop right there, and when we commit sin, we have the potential to have our transgressions forgiven to have our sins covered. Uh, and of course, we have this potential to be saved from our sin when it comes to our standing in God. But when it comes to our state, when it comes to our everyday life and our every, everyday existence, it is very true that we still are stuck in this body of death. And we are challenged every day with the temptations and the lusts of this flesh. And if we do sin, we can be forgiven. Our sins can be covered. Blessed is the man unto whom, in verse 2, the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. That word impute there means to charge. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord does not charge iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. And then notice verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. The devil knows that the end result of confession is forgiveness. That's what the end result of confession it is. It is forgiveness of sins. It is the washing away of the sins and the filth that those sins bring into our lives. And so the devil doesn't want us to go from sin to forgiveness. He doesn't want us to go from sin to forgiveness, and he doesn't want us to get there by confession. But the problem for so many Christians is that they don't confess their sins. Uh, look at verse 3. Look at what the psalmist says here. He said, when I kept silence. This is after the first two verses where the psalmist recognizes that blessed is he whose, tr whose trespasses are forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto th whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. When you skip to verse 5, how do we get our transgressions forgiven? And how do we get our sins covered? It's by acknowledging our sin unto God and then confessing our transgressions unto him. But when you look in verse 3, what do we see that the psalmist says? 
He says, but when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. That's the problem with a lot of Christians nowadays, is that even though there is a very real presence of sin in their life, there isn't a very thorough resolve to that sin as far as cleansing and forgiveness is concerned because there's no confession of that sin. There's no confession. And we can be a somewhat ho-hum about confession, and, and we can kind of say, yeah, you know, I ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins, so on and so forth. But is there really a true seeking of forgiveness and a very sincere confession of sin to the Lord in our lives? And that's the question I would really like to ask you tonight. Self-examination. When was the last time you confessed your sin to God? and sought forgiveness. When was the last time? And once again, not in a very generic uh, uh, approach. And I know that, of course, the Lord taught us how to pray and uh, forgive us our sins and, and those things. Not a very generic approach, but a real true uh, uh, searching for forgiveness through the confession of your sin to an almighty God. When was the last time you confessed your sins to God. Now, if you were here this morning, of course, confession was, uh, was part of the topic of discussion uh, with Mike Walski, the missionary, and, and those who perhaps have grown up or have experienced the Catholic religion and the confessional booth and going to the priest and saying uh, those things, the things that I'm not familiar with, things that I've never experienced, uh, but those things that uh, would be necessary. Uh, that is one of the things, I, I suppose, that when you go into the confessional booth, you're supposed to examine when the last time you went into confession was. Is, is that right for those of you who have experience? Uh, uh, um, I'm not even going to presume what the wording is, uh, but they remember when the last time was. And then they confess that to the priest. When was your last time that you actually confessed your sins to God? When was your last time that you did that? If you can't remember the last time you confessed your sins to God, it's certainly not because you haven't sinned. Let's just stop and recognize that real quick. Uh, we all are stuck in this flesh. Every day that we live, we have our secret sins. We have our besetting sins. We have our presumptuous sins. We have our sins of neglect. Uh, we have our sins of omission. We sin every day of our lives, whether we realize it or not. So much so that it's probably impossible to keep up and there has to be some kind of broad, generic approach to God where we say, God, please forgive me uh, for the transgressions of my youth and for the sins of my days. There's, there's so many that I can't even keep up with them. But there's no doubt that we know on some level what sins we are committing. We know what the sins are that we struggle with. And some are even more obvious than some of the petty sins that we fight with, if there is really such a thing as a petty sin. But this is what I want you to understand uh, and look and consider in Psalms chapter 32. I want you to consider the progression of, uh, of this passage from start to finish of getting from sin to forgiveness. As, as you consider when the last time you confessed your sins to the Almighty God, and perhaps it's been a while, and perhaps it's been insufficient. And I think this passage sheds some light, perhaps, on why uh, we may have overlooked this very important element of our Christian life. We all should be confessing our sins to an almighty God in prayer. We all should be doing that. It should be a very present and a very active part of our Christian life. But notice this first. Uh, first in verses 1 and 2, once again, you have the presence of, of sin. Uh, in those verses, it's the recognition that we can be forgiven, that they can be covered, that blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. But there in verses 1 and 2, you have the presence of sin, uh, that there is sin in the psalmist's life. But then in verse 3, this is what you need to notice, that once that sin is committed, and in the period of time when that sin is not taken care of, when the sin is not confessed and forgiven, and it's not taken away and it's not covered, in that period of time, notice that there is an element of guilt that the sinner experiences in his life. So you start with sin, and then you experience guilt. 
Look again at what it says. When I kept silence, when I kept silence about the sin and the iniquity and the transgression in my life, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the, into the drought of summer. Say la. When we have a real understanding and a real relationship of God, and when we have a true appreciation of his righteousness and his holiness and what his expectations and demands of us are in our life when it comes to righteousness and holiness. And when we go against those, uh, those expectations and when we go against what God requires of us in our lives and we are in that state of, of guilt as far as that sin is concerned, if, if we're close with God, we're going to have a problem. We are going to feel the weight of that sin upon us. We are going to feel his hand heavy upon us. And our moisture is going to be turned into the drought of summer. Look at Psalms chapter 38, just a few uh, chapters over. To see this uh, said in, in a few more words. Psalms chapter 38. And this is, this, is, this is what I would like you to examine also. Do you experience this in your Christian life? This is a great moment of self-examination. Do you experience these thoughts that the psalmist is communicating in Psalms chapter 32 and also in 38? Look at what it says in verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have you ever felt that God was just so displeased with you and your sin? Neither, and and, and you, you were just concerned, Lord... Please don't chasten me with your hot displeasure. Have you ever felt it in those terms? I presume that many Christians never have. Or don't, at least. Maybe at one point in their life they have. But for some reason their sin does not uh, help them or allow them to understand that God is, is sorely displeased with us when we sin against him. Look at verse 2. For thine arrows... Stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Do you see the guilt that the psalmist is experiencing here? Do you see that he finds no satisfaction when he is stuck in the guilt and the responsibility of his sin. Before it is ever forgiven, before it is ever covered, washed away, do you see that, that heaviness that is upon him? That's guilt that he is experiencing. Do we experience that? Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Verse 4, For mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As in heavy burden they are too Heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Have you ever been in this state where you just felt like you just stunk like a skunk because of your sins? Where you were just corrupt and it's like you just had this filthiness just draped all over you? I wonder, I wonder how many do. This is what sin should cause in our lives. This is what iniquity and the transgression of God's law should make us to feel. We ought, we ought to feel the consequences of sin and the consequences of sinning against a holy and a perfect and a righteous God. Because we claim to be Christians who believe this book we claim to believe the truth of this word. We claim to be saved from our sins because we called upon our Savior. But then the question is, well, do we really feel and believe that we are guilty of the sin that we continue to commit? And if so, do we feel that weight? Do we feel that guiltiness, that uncleanness, that stink all over us? Uh, continue reading. Verse 5, My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Have you ever committed a sin? 
and just before you were able to get that right, or before you, uh, just because you refused to get it right, or you ne neglected to get it right, just all day long, just unsettled, just mourning, just not right. I go mourning all the day long. Verse 7, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by the reason of the disquietness of my heart. That there, my friend, is guilt. <laughs> that is guilt for having sinned against God. Feeling that and having that experience. And woe is unto us if we have allowed the guilt of sin to escape from our hearts and from our lives. Woe is unto us. And the reason why I say that, because turn back to Psalms chapter 32. Turn back to Psalms chapter 32. The reason why I say that is because we are looking at the progression of how we get from sin to forgiveness. And the progression is this, is that we start with our sin. We start with our sin. Uh, it could be fornication. It could be selfishness. It could be idolatry. It could be stealing. Uh, it could be anger. It could be uh, 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 unrighteous wrath. Uh, whatever your sin is, and that's kind of what you have to think about tonight. That's what you have to examine. What is your sin? Uh, you know, what is your trouble? What is your iniquity in your life? Because you commit that sin, and then what you're supposed to feel is guilt for that sin. And then once you get that guilt upon you and you are urged and you are moved and compelled to take the next step, uh, this is what it says in Psalms 32. Of course, the psalmist initially kept silent. Look at verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones wax old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer and selah. But once he had enough of that guilt, the next step was confession. It was confession. Look at what it says in verse 5. After that, after keeping silence, he got to the point where he said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And so the psalmist commits this sin. He feels the guilt of that sin, and it compels him to go to the Creator, to the God that he sinned against, to acknowledge that sin to him and to confess it to him and not to hide anything from him. And that's what should come after guilt. That's what guilt should compel us to do. That heaviness of his hand upon us should compel us to seek restitution with our God, to seek forgiveness and to seek to have our sins forgiven and covered. And then once we make that confession, you see in the end of verse 5, he says, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. And so that is the progression of how we get from sin to forgiveness. How we get our sins on a daily basis taken care of. Not when it comes to the salvation of our soul, but when it comes to our state and our relationship with an almighty God. Because don't forget that your iniquities have hid his face from you. And your sins, I'm thinking of Psalms chapter 59. Uh, let me read it to you. Psalm, uh, Isaiah chapter 59. Don't forget that Isaiah chapter 59, it says this. And if you want to turn there with me as I do it, uh, go ahead and I'll probably beat you. But Isaiah 59, it says this in verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin separates us from our God. Not eternally, but positionally or in a state where our relationship with him is compromised. It's just like if I had a problem with my dad, if I had transgressed against him and did something that was offensive to him. We are at that point where we are not necessarily on talking terms until that offense is taken care of. And so our relationship is strained. And this is true of our relationship with God. We need to get that sin taken care of. And so we go to him and confess our sin to him and seek forgiveness from him to wash us and to cleanse us. To acknowledge means to this. It means this. To own or confess 
as implying a consciousness of guilt. That's what it means to acknowledge. So when the psalmist said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, what he is saying is that he is accepting the consciousness of guilt in his life. The consciousness of the guilt of his sin and where that puts him with his creator. And because of that, he is owning up to it. It's to own it. This is and would have been the uh, title of my message tonight. It's own up. Own up. Own up to the sins that are in your life and the iniquities that are in your life and confess them and recognize the consciousness of your guilt. Because if you are not getting from sin to forgiveness, that means that you're not getting from sin to confession. Because if you confess your sins to an almighty God and seek his forgiveness, he will forgive you. So if you're not getting from sin to confession, then where are you getting stuck? Who can tell me? What's the progression? Sin, guilt, confession, forgiveness. If you're not getting from sin to confession, then you're not feeling guilty for your sins. You're just not getting it. You're not getting there. Uh, this is what is happening in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times sh uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. And then it says in the end of verse 2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We are in the last days and we are in the day and age where we as believers and Christians, we have seared our conscience and we have lost the feeling of guilt in our life. And because of that, confession is not a part of our daily walk. We don't confess our sins to God. For some reason, we don't feel the weight of our sins. We don't feel his heavy hand upon us. We don't feel the chastisement of his hot displeasure. Our bones are just fine all day long. Even though we just transgressed against an almighty God, something's missing. We have lost the guilt of sin in our lives if we are not getting to that point of confession. Romans chapter 7 verse 13 says this, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment, I love this next phrase, might become exceeding sinful. I just love the wording of that phrase right there. You know what sin needs to become in our lives? It needs to become exceeding sinful. When we transgress against a holy and a true and a righteous God, we need to have a very present consciousness of the fact that it is unacceptable for us to sin against an almighty God, a holy God and a perfect God and a righteous God. Sin needs to become exceeding sinful in our lives. So much so where we despise it, where we hate it. We do all that we can to avoid it, to turn from it, to pass by it, and to turn away. Anything that we can do uh, to get sin out of our lives, uh, to resist the devil, because if we do it, we are sinning against our Creator, against our Heavenly Father, against our Savior. Uh, we are sinning against our God, and we need to hate it. And if we do sin, then we need to experience the heaviness of that guilt upon us. Don't become so callous to sin. Don't let your conscience get so seared that when you commit that sin, and once again, don't forget, we are not without sin so much so that we can go days, weeks, months without confessing our sins to a holy God because we're doing that good. It's just not, it's just not so. It can't be so. We are those sinners. Uh, talk to Paul when you get to heaven and see what his experience is like or was like or go over to Romans chapter 7 and read about it. 
O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, he said. Turn over to Psalms chapter 51. This is a fantastic passage for what we are discussing tonight. We will uh, make uh, some further and final observations in Psalms chapter 51. And before we really get into those observations, I'd like you to look at Psalms chapter 51. I want you uh, to look there at verses 5 and 6 because it really shows the, uh, the uh, essence of our existence where it says in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There's the reality that we are sinners. We were shapen in sin. Uh, 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 we were shaped in iniquity, and in sin did our mother conceive us. By nature, we are sinners. It should be no surprise, and quite honestly, in some sense, it should be no shame, especially when considering the initial remarks, how the devil would like to take shame away from us in order to allow us to sin, and then restore shame in us so that we are, uh, um, that we are not urged or compelled or we are afraid to go to our holy creator to confess our sins to him. But it is no shame to accept the fact that you sin every day because you were born in sin. By, sin, uh, uh, you are, uh, by nature, you are a sinner. Listen, if you're struggling with this fact, you're in good company tonight. You are with a whole bunch of other sinners. We're all on the same page here. We are all in the same boat. Uh, we all have our problems and we all have our struggles, the temptations that we give into. Just accept it. It is reality. Stop fighting against it and stop thinking so highly of yourself because man at his best state is altogether vanity and full of sin. That's just who we are. But we can't stop there and just accept sin in our lives. We can't accept it. We can't say, you know what, I'm okay. That's just who I am. I'm probably going to commit this sin again because this is my besetting sin. This is my weakness in life. And so I'll do my best until then. And when that next temptation comes around, if I fall, I'll get it right again. And so on and so forth. And this is why, because look at verse 6. The reality of our nature is in verse 5. But the reality of God's expectations is in verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You know what God wants us to be? He wants us to be full of the purity and the righteousness of truth. He wants us to be clean. He wants us to be right with him. He wants us to be full of wisdom so that we can fear him and hate evil. That is what God expects from each and every one of his children tonight. And that's what we should strive for. And that's what we should long for. And so when we fall uh, to the weaknesses of verse 5, and then we come to the understanding of verse 6 that God uh, desires truth and he desires righteousness and holiness in our lives, then uh, what we have, uh, what we have uh, accessible to us is confession to get our sin right with the holy God. So Psalms chapter 51 is a great chapter. Look at what it says. Uh, there's uh, the initial reading there for those of you who have it in your Bible. But it says there right before verse 1, if you look down and you have it there, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. If there is any chapter in the Bible... If God went up to David and said, you can take any chapter out of the Bible that you want, uh, it, it's probably pretty easy to think about what chapter that would be. Does anybody know what chapter that is? Anybody? It's in Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Get it out, God, if I, if, if, uh, if I were David. Because right there in 2 Samuel chapter 11, what you have is that whole story of where David uh, did not go out to war like he should have, stayed behind, and all of a sudden he got his eyes on Bathsheba, and uh, he did things that he ought not to do, and he, la he laid with her. And then, of course, uh, she became with child, but there was a problem because she was married. 
She had a husband, and his name was called Uriah. And we know what happened is that uh, in order to try to cover up his sin, all the while while being silent, if you understand what I'm saying, instead of confessing his sin, he tried to take care of it himself. And so he brought Uriah home, and he tried to fix it in different manners. And when Uriah uh, wouldn't allow that fix to be had, uh, he said, you know what, Uriah, take this letter back to Joab and give it to him as soon as you return to the battlefield. And you know what was in that letter? It was his death sentence. It, that's what it was, because he told uh, Joab through that letter to put Uriah at, uh, in the battle at the hottest point of battle. And the reason was is so that he could die. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, he sent him uh, into the, uh, the uh, heated battle, uh, and they, uh, they approached him, and the archer shot at him, and, and of course he was stuck fast, and he fell down, and he died. And so you know what uh, David was guilty of? Amongst many things, he was guilty of adultery, and he was guilty of murder, amongst other things. Now, I would say take that chapter out of the Bible, if God came up to me and said, go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, but what you have here is we know that David was a man after God's own heart, and we know that David found forgiveness, even for adultery, and God forbid, even for murder. As so many of us would think, that's not even possible. But we find it right here in Psalms chapter 51 is how he found that forgiveness. So read along with me, and we will just make a few observations at four different points, and then we will be done. Look at what it says in verse 1. Have mercy upon me. This is what David is saying. And, and no doubt the guilt that he is feeling is heavy, and that sore displeasure is hard upon him, and that, uh, that chastisement, he is feeling it. And he says this in prayer, in confession, and this is what we ought to do when we are faced with the realness of our sins that we have committed in our lives. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Now we're going to read many other verses, but before we continue on, as David seeks forgiveness and as he approaches God to confess his sin, I want you to realize this, that when you are under the guilt of sin, approach God upon the merits of his loving kindness and mercy and not upon your own merits. Because for some reason, uh, there are many that approach God thinking that they deserve forgiveness. That there is... Uh, I deserve forgiveness just so that I can continue my life and live in relative happiness and joy and satisfaction. And I don't like the heaviness of this sin on me. I don't like this guilt. And God, you said that you love me. You said that you would bless me and that you would take good care of me. And so that's why I'm coming to you and you owe me forgiveness. And so I'm coming to confess my sins to you. If that's how you're approaching God in your confession, you're approaching him the wrong way. The only reason God will forgive you through the confession of your sins is because of his loving kindness and the multitude of his tender mercies. He is not obligated outside of the realm of his word to forgive you of your sins. But because of his loving kindness... And because of his tender mercies, he gave us his word that he would forgive us. And that's how we need to approach God. God, I'm coming to you because you are the only one who is able and willing to forgive me of my wretched sin. And so, God, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, according to your loving kindness, please blot out my transgressions. When you approach God and you seek forgiveness through the confession of your sins, recognize that he doesn't have to forgive you, but that because of his mercy and his loving kindness, he is willing to. And take advantage and, and gain access to that loving kindness and that mercy. Approach him no matter how wicked your sin is, no matter how shameful it is. Realize that there is nothing that we should hide from him. God is a refuge for us. The Bible says pour out your heart to him is what it says. He is a refuge for us. 
Selah. There is nothing that we should hide from God. His mercy is so infinite and his loving kindness is so expansive that if we come to him seeking forgiveness, no matter how wicked our transgressions are, he is willing to accept us and to forgive us and to wash us from our sins. And so, God, because of your mercy and because of your loving kindness, I can come unto you. So verse 1 of Psalms chapter 51 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And then in verse 2 it says in, in David's confession, Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me. From my sin. When you come to God in confession of your sin, seeking forgiveness, understand how filthy your sin makes you and ask God to wash you. Understand and recognize and fully realize in sincerity that your sin makes you an unclean person. It makes you vile, it makes you dirty. It's just like when you're out, especially for um, those who have a, 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 perhaps a hard working job. Roofing, I, one of the reasons I don't like roofing is because it smells. There's something, there's just a weird smell that comes off of those shingles, you know, and tearing off the roof. Do you, you don't like it, Mr. Smazniak, do you? It's bad. You do? Well, it, is, it can be fun. It's a great time of fellowship and everything. But when I just helped, I helped Tim and Jill with their roof, and uh, we did our best <laughs> despite the challenges. And I'm driving home, and I'm like, oh, man. And you know who was in the back seat was Brian and Bella. Uh, um, yeah, Brian was with us, and Bella, uh, they were all hanging out playing games. I don't know why we didn't have them up on the roof, you know, helping us and everything. Uh, but driving home, and I'm thinking, these poor, uh, these poor kids, they have to smell this from Tim's house to our house, and we're driving Brian off at his house, and it's just that awful smell. And you know what? When I got home, you know what the first thing I wanted to do was? Get in that shower and just get that soap all over me and just get that dirt and that stink off of me. You know what sin does? It makes us dirty and stinky. We already talked about it, but it stinks. And when we come to God and when we seek forgiveness, we have to stop and realize that this is no joke. This isn't just something uh, ritualistic that I'm doing. I need a spiritual transaction to, to take place, not for the salvation of my soul, but for the cleansing of this flesh and this body and of my heart. I need something to take place. I need something to happen. Uh, when you approach God for forgiveness through the confession of your sin, it is not just to ease the conscience of your mind, but it is more primarily to cleanse you from the filthiness of your sin. That's what confession is in seeking forgiveness. In the mid-1960s, the Lutheran Church in Pittsburgh established the Listening Ear Service which enabled people to telephone ministers at the church to confess anything that they felt guilty about. It is said that for the most part, the minister said nothing, but just listened until the person who was confessing was able to, quote, get it off his chest, unquote. And if that's your approach to confession, just to get it off your chest, so that you can just ease your mind and ease your conscience and just kind of to ease the guilt of your sin. If that's your approach to confession, then you have the wrong approach. You need more than just easing your conscience and the guiltiness of your mind. You need cleansing. You need washing. You need that sin to be washed away. You need a clean heart. First John chapter 1 is a great chapter and offers us a wonderful opportunity. Because it says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. And then just two verses later in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
that is why we come to God with confession. That's why we should come to God with confession of our sin. That is why we must come to God with confession of our sins. Because if you are not confessing your sin to God, guess what is happening? You are continuing to stink. You are continuing to have that dirt and that uncleanness just get piled on your, on, your, on your heart and on your flesh, and you stink and you are dirty if you are not confessing your sins to God. On top of the guilt that you should be feeling, you need to go to confession and ask God for forgiveness. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, is what the psalmist says in Psalms chapter 51, verse 2. And then he says this in verse 3. Look at Psalms chapter 51 and verse 3. For I, and this is it, this is it right here, this is the confession. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Let me say this out of this verse. Own up to your sin and realize that the sin that is ever before you is also before the Lord as well. You know, so sometimes God or sometimes the devil brings that shame back to us. Uh, where we commit sins, where we just want to cover our heads and hide our face when we come to God in prayer. Because I just don't want to deal with it. I don't, I don't want to approach that. I don't want to uh, deal with that and, and, and uh, talk to my Heavenly Father about that. But realize this. This is what the psalmist said. My sin is ever before me. That's the guilt that he has been feeling. My sin is ever before me. I continually see it. Uh, turn over to Psalms chapter 90, verse 8, as it would be just a few pages over. If our sin is ever before us, realize this. Psalms chapter 90, verse 8. The psalmist says this, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Speaking of God. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee our secret sins in the light of his countenance. And the reason why I'm looking at that verse, because listen, if your sin is ever before you, and you are crushed with the guilt of that sin, then you can be sure and recognize that your sin and your iniquity is laid before him as well. And your secret sins are in the light of his countenance. He sees it all. And so what's the significance of that? Just own up to it. Just stop running from it. Stop hiding from it. Stop ignoring it. Own up to it and confess your sins and pour your heart out to God. And seek His forgiveness. You are hiding nothing from God by trying to skirt around the issue. Acknowledge your sin, name it, and own up to it. God, I said something about so-and-so that I shouldn't have said and I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Wash me from this sin. God, I looked at something that I should not have looked at. Name it, and I, and I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I am guilty. God, I said something that I sh shouldn't have said. I went somewhere that I shouldn't have gone. Now, I haven't been doing something that I should have been doing and I should be doing, and acknowledge your sin. Own up to it and confess your sin to a God who already knows and who can forgive you and wash you. And then look in verse 4. Uh, just another great verse. Notice what he says there. Here, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. As we read that verse, recognize in your confession that your sin is ultimately against a holy God and it is a transgression of His holy law. It's a really interesting uh, verse and there's a great parallel pas passage for the sake of time. I won't look at it, uh, but over in Genesis chapter 39, if you're taking notes or if you'd like to think about this and meditate on it later uh, today or through the week, uh, Genesis chapter 39, verses 4 through 9, the story of Joseph in Potiphar's house and where Potiphar's wife comes and challenges him. It's a really uh, interesting reaction uh, 
that when he is, uh, when he is tempted by Potiphar's wife, he goes through this whole list of what he has been given in his master's house. The only thing that God has withheld from him or that his master has withheld from him is his wife. But the reason why he refuses to lie with her is not ultimately because of his good standing in Potiphar's eyes. This is what he says to Potiphar's wife. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's what he says. And that's what David is saying here. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, they had a child um, uh, that w- would have been a, a product of a, an adulterous re- a relationship. And then he went and, and through deceitful measures, he tried to cover it up. And then he had Uriah the husband murdered and killed. And you know what he says to God in his confession? He says against the the only have I sinned. Isn't that something? Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. We need to change our approach to sin and realize and recognize once again that it is a transgression against the law of an almighty God and our holy creator. I may lie to Doug and I may do him wrong. And I may affect him in a way where I may need to get right with him. But ultimately what I have done is I have sinned against my God. And I can go to him and get it right. But if I don't go to God and get it right, then I still stink. And I'm still dirty. Because I need the blood of his son to cleanse me and to wash me. I need to recognize and I need to approach sin in such a way where sin is so exceedingly sinful, not because it affects me and not because it affects my well-being, not because it affects my potential success and because of the blessings that God can give me or that I can experience in this life and my relative ability to be prosperous in life, but because it's a sin against God. That is why I ought to feel the exceeding guiltiness of sin. Not because it's bad for me, but because I'm sinning against him. And we need to recognize that in our confession to God. God, I have sinned against you. And then this final thought, we're going to skip a few verses and go down to verse 10. Uh, Notice what it says in Psalms chapter 51, verse 10. This should be the end result, and this should be the purpose that we have in our confession. This is what David asks, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. When you confess your sins to God and when you seek forgiveness, follow through with true repentance in turning from your sin to serve the living and the true God. I understand we have our besetting sins, we have our weaknesses, we have those things that we will probably struggle with for the rest of our lives until we get a new body. And hopefully that time will come soon. But our earnest desire ought to have a clean heart created within us and to have a right spirit renewed in us, so much so that we can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So much so where God can transform us in such a way where sin no longer holds us captive where sin no longer has that stronghold on us, but where we can rise above sin in victory, not through our own strength, not through our own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cleanseth us from sin, to have a tremendous purpose. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at what it says in verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed, to repentance. There's a difference between worldly sorrow and there's a difference between godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is this stinks for me and so I'm sorry for it. This affects my success. This affects me, my happiness, my well-being. And so I'm sorry that I did the wrong that I did. And that's not a good sorrow. Godly sorrow is this. Uh, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. 
godly sorrow leads us to repentance, realizing all these things that we've considered tonight. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And verse 11 says this, For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sword. This is David in Psalms chapter 51. Sorrowing after a godly sword. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And this is what we all should be longing for before we finish this verse. This is what we all should be longing for through the confession of our sin as we seek forgiveness and washing and cleansing. Look at that last uh, phrase right there. In all these things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. If you want to be cleared from the, the responsibility and the guilt of your sin, then I urge you to make confession of your sins a daily process. Recognize the heaviness of your sin. Seek to clear yourself of it through, through confession, to gain forgiveness and washing for the intent that God could create in you a clean heart and renew your mind daily so that he can do something with you, so that he can use you to do great things for him. Let's stand for prayer.